Hello, everybody. We're going to get going. Okay. I said we wanted to just. Sorry, we're getting going a little bit late. We wanted to give more some people time to get here. I'm Mike Thomas, the deputy superintendent of schools. I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, safety and security has always been high on our list here in the Brockton Public Schools. Uh, between uh, drills, um, uh, locks that we've done throughout the school system, uh, surveillance cameras, and again, the only school system in the state that has an academy trained armed police force to protect our students and staff um, who work very well with our students, with our parents. Um, and I'm happy to say we have five new officers starting. Um, they are now in training. They've come out of the academy. They're training with the Brockton police. They do a um, few months of training with them and then they'll be with uh, full time with the school police within the next few weeks. So, uh, and we welcome them. I want to welcome some of our elected officials that are here tonight. I want to, Dennis Ionieri from Ward 3. And I saw Ann Boregard from Ward 5. I want to thank her for coming out. Um, school committee member Joyce Azak from Ward 6. Thank you. And school committee member uh, Judy Sullivan from Ward 5. We want to thank them all for coming out. Kathy Smith, the superintendent, couldn't be here tonight. She is uh, receiving an award at, at Bridgewater State. Um, so she sends her regards and wants to thank you for coming. Uh, I want to thank the Attorney General's Office for sponsoring what they call the Sandy Hook Promise. That's trainings that they do with our students in middle school and high school on um, awareness about mental health, awareness about violence pre prevention. Uh, so they are doing presentations in our schools. They started at Brockton High this week. Uh, they'll be working with our alternative schools and they'll work with our middle schools within the next few weeks before the end of the school year. Again, that's sponsored by the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office and it's called the Sandy Hook Promise and you can find information on that on their website, the Sandy Hook, Hook Promise website. But again, it's about violence prevention. It's about uh, students recognizing when their peers are struggling uh, with issues. Um, so it's a really good program and it, again, it came free of charge from the Attorney General's Office. So I'm going to turn this over now for, um, to Tobias Cowens. I uh, used to work with the school department and still does. Uh, he used to be full time with the school department with safety and security, but now he, um, he spent some time with the mayor's office as the assistant chief of staff and also works with us uh, on a lot of, a lot of our um, transportation, um, safety and security, bus evacuation drills, um, reunification centers. So Tobias spent a lot of time working on, uh, with us with that. So, I'm going to bring Ty, Tobias up to say a few words. Thank you, Mike. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out this evening. I started roughly with um, the school department back in 2015 under a REMS grant, and it was a $300,000 grant when times were good, right, Mike? And um, it allowed us to look at the safety system, not only in the state of Mass, but also around the country and to look at implementing best practices. So over the past, I'd say, eight or so years, we've made so many changes. A lot of what we've done in the past has also included working with the schools inside the building, outside the building, working with the bus companies, working with the custodians, working with the teachers, working with the principals, and the topics that we've worked on have just been so vast. Um, you're hearing now, in the past couple of years, a lot about school shootings. Well, in the past, I'd say 15 years, there have been 13 school shootings in Massachusetts. Uh, 12 were fatalities. The one that occurred here in 2010 is the only one that occurred that was not a fatality. So we've been ahead of the curve. The Office of Mayor Bill Carpenter has been very supportive of school safety. And even though I work for the mayor full time, part of my duties include working with the school department and first student bus company on uh, bus evacuation drills. We do drills in October uh, using the front door, rear doors, then we do them again in March using the rear doors. Pretty much 100% of our students are trained on what to do if the bus or the bus driver is incapacitated, and that's very important. The thing that we're working on now is now looking at the uh, van safety. I think you recall Mike, about two weeks ago there was an incident where someone fell out of a van. So part of what we're looking a private, private, not a contractor, a private van. But part of what we try to do is we try to share our resources, not only in the city, but also with the private schools. So we work with uh, Trinity Catholic. Uh, we work with the 
Spelman. So we try to share our services and resources pretty much across the city. So on behalf of Mayor Carpenter, I'd like to also inform you about Seat Click Fix. Have any of you heard about Seat Click Fix? It's an app, Gray, I see a few hands go up. It's an app you can download that if you see a problem in your neighborhood, you see a crime, you can actually go to this app, see Click Fix, click on it, and identify the problem, and that issue that you're addressing will go straight to that department. We pretty much respond to this within 24 hours. So please use it. There's some forms to remind you of it on the desk outside. Thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you. Uh, also, we had a um, school committee member from Ward 6, Tim Sullivan, just came in. So we take seven. seven, Ward 7. I always get my wards mixed up. Ward 7, school committee member, uh, Tim Sullivan is with us. Thank you for being here. So I'm going to bring up um, Lieutenant Frank Fadaro. He is the lieutenant now in charge of school police. He came to us about six months ago. Um, he's been a Brockton police lieutenant uh, for, um, and a Brockton police department member for several years. He came over to school police six months ago to take over the command of school police. Um, as you know about when Tobias mentioned, there was a shooting on the steps of the gym of Brockton High back in 2010. It was during uh, basketball trials and it happened at about six o'clock at night. At that time, the school police went through a restructure and the city decided to bring over a lieutenant from the Brockton Police Department to be the commanding officer of school police. Uh, we had Lieutenant Mills for several years, um, and now Lieutenant Fadaro has taken over for Lieutenant Mills. So we want to welcome Lieutenant Fadaro, who, who's, com who's come in and really jumped into the job um, and is very serious, obviously, about safety and security, and uh, he's going to spend the next few minutes with you. So thank you, Lieutenant. Good evening, folks. Thank you for coming out. I do appreciate it. Uh, this is my first rodeo with this type of a um, forum, so bear with me. Um, like like um, Deputy Superintendent Thomas said, my name is Lieutenant Frank Fadaro. I've been with the Brockton Police Department for about 20 years now. Uh, before I came over to schools, I was the sergeant in charge of the gang unit for Brockton PD, so quite a change. Um, I'm loving it, it's a, it's a good change. That being said, this my clicker. So, I just want to warn you guys. I don't know if any of you have seen this video. This was put on by parents of some of the children that were killed in the Sandy Hook incident. Um, it can get a little emotional at the end, so. Gonna play this. You're gonna hit this for me. I'm here at the scene of tomorrow's shooting, where a 15-year-old will kill four children, two adults, and then turn the gun on himself. When the shooting starts happening tomorrow, first I'll probably just think it's firecrackers or a car backfiring or something. He told some of us that his dad kept a gun in his closet, and he always talked about using it on, you know, the people that bullied him. Tomorrow, I'll probably say that I wish I told someone. You know, after the shooting, we're going to feel pretty bad about picking on him, but until then, we'll probably just keep doing it because he's pretty weird. Uh, tomorrow, I'll probably point out that something has seemed off with him since the beginning of the school year. And I'm now joined by the officers who will be the first responders tomorrow. What additional details can you share with us? Well, someone is expected to tell us after the shooting that the shooter has been posting on social media about doing this for weeks. So how will you explain the shooting to your daughter? Actually, I won't get to explain it to her because she won't make it. This is Christine Lynn reporting from the scene of another shooting. We'll say we never saw coming. Okay, so I went back to 2013. These are all the school shootings nationwide since 2013. It was pretty even right up until 2017. 2018, we saw a spike, 103 school shootings across the nation. So far this year, in 2019, there's been 44 school shootings. 
what we train school staff, they are our first line of defense for our children. They are the front line. We're in the school system as police officers. We can't be at all of the schools. If this occurs at a school, first line of defense is the teachers. We train them in lockdown procedures based off of Alice. I'll fast forward to this. Alice is alert. You hear something? Always assume the worst. You hear something that sounds like fireworks or firecrackers in your school? Always assume that it's, that it's real. This is no particular order to do this. We do not advocate locking down and hiding. This is something that you, the kids are just sitting ducks, like what happened at Sandy Hook. They were told to hide in a closet or a bathroom. The preferred response is to evacuate. Get the kids out. Even if the, if the shooter is right around the corner and you hear them and they're loud, get them out. Have them zigzag. Get them out. If you have an opportunity to leave, get them out. The only time that I would suggest an enhanced lockdown would be if it's the first room that the guy walks into and starts shooting up out in the hallway. Lock the door, secure the door, barricade the door, and then do one of two things. Either get these kids out a window, get them out a back door into another room, or prepare them. Now this is age appropriate, I understand that. It's gonna be different at the high school than it would be for an elementary school. Teach the kids to pick, pick something up. And if that guy gets through the door, there's no other means of escape, they had to whip stuff at him as hard and as fast as possible while hopefully an adult or two are able to maybe engage with this uh, assailant and, and put him down, hold him down. You get a bunch of kids sitting on him, you get this weapon away from him, he ain't going anywhere until somebody comes to help. Um, so like I said, preferred response is to evacuate. That's what we're teaching school staff. That is utmost, and I will be going School to school next year, I'm, I, I'm new to this, so um, I just went to the Alice training. So I will be coming to all of the schools and individually training all of the teachers. Again, I know this, everybody's been trained, but we want to we maintain your level of, uh, of, of practice with this so that it doesn't become something that you know you never do so it's not ingrained in you. Uh, repetitive, doing this repetitively will enhance your skills and make you to, there's a, uh, there's a slide that's ahead that explains this. Most, most people in a situation like this, they either freeze, anxiety, uh, they experience disbelief, this can't be happening, and they don't actually recover from it in time. This training will help the teachers and staff and the children because we're training them too. Because they can carry this into, into their college life, into the workplace, because as we know, these, school, these shootings happen everywhere. Um, so this, this training will provide the teachers with a means to regain their composure a little bit quicker to jump on the ball a little bit quicker, to understand what's going on faster and be able to react quicker to what's going on. Um, and, like, and like this slide, it empowers our children too to be active participants in saving themselves, in helping to save themselves. They come away with a better, a better knowledge and less fear of, of a school shooting because they'll have these options to fall back on. Okay, so some of the things we've implemented within the school system recently is the radio, the 911 radio channel. It's been, we have base stations, 911 base stations are installed in all school public, public school buildings. Um, we put repeaters throughout the city because believe it or not, when we were in the high school, one side of the high school, we couldn't communicate over the radio with the other side. They're fallout shelters, they're bomb shelters. That's what they were built for. So it was hard to get communications throughout the building. 
these repeaters and these in these exterior antennas have allowed us to we can we can now talk from the middle of the Brockton High School all the way over to the Brookfield School on these radios. They're also tied into the police department and the fire department. Monitor this 911 channel. So if something happens at a school and the high school is the base because the high school has people in it 24, well, not 24 seven, but with night school, they're there until some nights nine o'clock. So that is the best place to have our base. I will be having our base conduct radio checks to make sure that every school is monitoring their 911 channel so that if something does occur at one school, we can make sure that every school knows about it and they can lock down their schools. And then we can get officers on site at each school to make sure that if something else does occur or if somebody else tries to go into one of the other schools, we have somebody there waiting. But it gives them that enhanced warning to lock down their schools, keep the kids safe, and, um, and then we get somebody there as soon as possible. Now on the other side of it, also tied into the Brockton High School, at least for now, we have Eagle Gunshot Detection Lockdown System. A company has come out. They showed us a they showed us a video on what they have to offer. And what this does is there's there's base units that they put throughout the high school. Um, there's one in each of the caps, and then there's what's called fireflies that are in some of the outskirt um, hallways, second floor. We're going to get some in the second floor hallways, but. If somebody comes in and, and shoots, it will detect it instantaneously. It will send a message to every Brockton police officer out there, all of us at the school, in real time, that something's going on at the high school, where it is going on in the high school, what caliber rounds are being shot in the high school. And it will also, it's tied into the high school's um, PA system. And it will notify in several different languages. I think there's, what, five? seven different languages, what's going on? And it'll just say, active shooter in the cap in all of those languages. And everybody will be trained, teachers will be trained to get everybody out of the school that can get out of the school, that's not directly in the cafeteria. And then we'd go back down into the, the Alice procedures that they've been trained to do. The, let's face it, the high school, most likely, those kids will take this guy out. They're not gonna just hit, sit and hide and be victims. Um, <clears throat> It is also tied into the camera system, or will be tied into the camera system. So the cameras will follow this person, and we'll know exactly where they are in real time. And we'll be able to engage him quickly. Now, all of my new offices that um, Deputy Superintendent Thomas introduced to you, or told you about, they're all going to be trained in great programs over the summer, as well as I will be. And they're going to be doing active shooter training throughout the summer. We'll also be doing drills through all the different schools. Once, once school comes back in session, we'll be doing um, active shooter drills. We'll be, we'll be letting you parents know that we're going to be doing them, but we want, I want to try to make this as realistic as possible. So we will be going to the different schools. They're not going to know it. And we'll come out front and we'll say, call over your intercom system, this is a drill, active shooter, and we will come in. And I want them to do what they would do in an active shooter situation. Just so they can get kind of a better idea on what to expect and, and what type of chaos to expect in a situation where there may be an active shooter coming in the school. So with that being said, I am going to hand the microphone over to Officer Anderson and Officer Mosley, and they're going to go over some of the social media issues that we're dealing with, we're seeing in the schools. There you go, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Officer Mosley. I'm with the Brockton School Police. We've been on for 18 years. Uh, born and raised in this lovely city, uh, Brockton. Um, I went to Hancock School, West Junior High, Brockton High, graduated, went to college, came back here, became a police officer. 
And that's it. Have a good night. Uh, no, uh, as you may, if you guys were here, if you folks were here last year, you know that we've been um, going around to different junior high schools and been doing a social media presentation for the last two years. Um, this year, you know, we, we started, we, we actually started doing um, some, some things a little bit different. We, uh, we didn't get to all the junior high schools this year because it's kind of been a little, uh, a little busy, but we have managed to get to some of the junior high schools, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, maybe, possibly. I don't know, it's getting, you know, May, nice weather, you know, want to do something like clean the car, wash, you know, all that stuff. But anyway, tonight we're here to uh, talk to you about some staying safe in the virtual world. Um, we're just going to give you a brief overview of what we have been speaking about in the, class, in, the uh, in the junior high schools. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my partner. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I know you guys are tired after a long day of work, right? But you guys made it here, so we are very, very proud, and thank you for being here today. Uh, so I'm Officer Anderson. I've been with the Brockton Police Department. This is my 11th year now. I'm currently the school resource officer here at South Middle School. This is my home base here. But I'm also the school resource officer at the Huntington Alternative, which is right across the street. Uh, born and raised in the city, just like my partner. Born and raised right here in Brockton. I started off at the Raymond School, went over to North. After North, went over to Brockton High for a semester. Transferred after that semester to Spelman, and that's where I graduated from. So here I am in the Brockton school system, it's educated me. And it's a great opportunity to be in this position to now give back and to educate the youth here in Brockton. So I'm very, very grateful to be in this position today. Like my partner explained to you, we're gonna talk to you and give you a brief overview about the things that's going on in the virtual world that we're dealing with today. And we're also gonna discuss with you the good, the bad, the ugly, the things that we talk to about your children when it comes to social media. Before we go any further, whoever did not get any information out back, next to the Mills uh, restroom. There's some information back there about social media and also some information from great. I strongly suggest that you take some of that information because it will help you when you sit down with your children and have those conversations about social media. Make sense? All right, you want to take this? So we're going to start here. So parents, I need you to know that there's just some innate dangers that's going to be on social media. That's just the way it is of the world, and there's nothing that we can do about that, okay? The first one that you see up there, stranger danger. I know it's kind of cliche, but I like it, because if you think about it, when we talk about the population in this entire country, there's billions of people, right? In this world, excuse me. Billions of people, right? But when we talk about the cyber virtual world that your children are in, comparative, it's kind of peanuts. But what we want you to do is we want you to tell your children that, listen, you are having access, and these people are having access to you, and they're billions of people. You need to treat all of these people that you're interacting with and that have that access to you as if they're strangers. Because if you know that, you have that mindset, you're going to deal with things a little bit differently. You're going to move a little bit differently when you're using that social media. Make sense? All right. Next one, inappropriate material. Parents. When you guys give your child that smart device, you are giving them access to pretty much anything, including inappropriate material. So we're talking about sex, drugs, terrorism, right? How to make weapons, suicide. You're giving them access to that. So if you know that you're giving them access to this inappropriate material, a light bulb should go off and say, you know what? Maybe I need to set some restrictions. Maybe I shouldn't let my child be on these social media apps all the time. Let me see what they're doing. Because if you do that, then you're keeping your child safe and you end up keeping them out of trouble. Where now they don't have to deal with us, right? Because they did something inappropriate, now there's a legal ramification for that. Make sense? Please have that conversation. And while we're talking about that, I might as well bring that up. Um, one of the papers that's out back, you're gonna get it, it's called Screen Time if you haven't got it yet. How many of you guys have iPhones in here? Okay, some of you do. For those that have the iPhone, you can actually use your iPhone device and you can monitor what your child is doing on their social media. You can monitor the apps that they're using and you can actually restrict the time that they're on their phones using your iPhone. So please, if you haven't got it, please take that pamphlet out back when you leave. The third one, bad downloads. Parents, understand this. There's some people out there in this world that they just want to destroy your hard drive. That's just the way it is. And they love it because they know they can do it. 
So you've just got to be more cautious of the apps that you're clicking on, the websites that you're going on, the links that you're clicking on, the downloads that you're actually doing. Because not every download and every website is going to be a legit website, right? Or a download. So you want to be careful of that. I always tell the story, one day I was working in the lobby of the police department and this parent came in and they're like, oh my God, I have child pornography and it's on my phone. My phone is frozen, I don't know what to do. And the reason why, because they clicked on something, not really paying attention and just thinking it was a legit website and it wasn't. So you've got to be cautious when you are doing downloads, things like that. Make sense? Information theft, another one. There's people out there that want to take your hard work and money and they want to take my hard work and money. We don't want to make it easier for them. So do not give them your social security number, the last four of your social, your credit card information. They don't need that information, okay? I say this all the time, check those emails. Sometimes you might get some emails and they kind of look official, like say from a mortgage company, and you're like, oh, that kind of looks legit. That's the same icon that my mortgage company uses, but it may not be that. And they might say on that email, you know what, click here. For verification purposes, click here. And when you click there, you've now given this hacker the ability to now fish for your information. If you are unsure and there's something shady coming through on your email, call the company. Have a conversation. Did you guys send me an email for like verification? They're going to tell you because it's happened to me. And so I called the company and guess what? It was fraudulent. Someone was trying to fish my information. High tech bullying. Parents, it's happening. It's happening today and they're using social media to do it. So we just want you to have that dialogue with your children and let them know, don't be part of the problem, we want you to be part of the solution. If you're seeing the drama, get away from the drama, right? Help that person, because what I can tell you is this, is that if your child gets involved with social media and the high-tech bullying, and that particular child can't handle being bullied, and they end up committing suicide, your child's not gonna be able to live with that blood on their hands. So you want to have that discussion with them so they can stay away from the drama because it's happening, it's particularly in middle school. Awesome, Mosley. Thank you. For this segment here, this is just an old overview of the things that we tell your kids when we do the social media presentation. The first thing that we talk about is telling them not to get lost in the technology world. And I love technology. I love where it's going. It's amazing. But we tell them don't get lost. And remember, it's the little things in life that truly matter the most, which is what? your family, your close friends, your education, you working on yourself to become a better person. So we do have that dialogue with your children and we hope that you're gonna have the same. The other portion of the uh, presentation that we do, we talk about technology today versus the 1980s. And in that segment, what I do is I go over how, well, we, show, we show video of, of a mother and her kids and how the mother grew up in the 80s, and the kids are actually, uh, as you know now, growing up today, and basically taking the technology back then and having the kids use it and try to figure it out. And the comparison, like one of the videos that we use, is that they have a, like a cassette player. And the little girl's trying to figure out how to use it with the cassette player, you know, how to play, pause, record, and all that stuff, and just trying to figure it out, as opposed to today, as you evolve, you have the MP3 player where you just actually just plug it into the computer, Scroll down, click, click, and you download about, what, 100 songs in about less than, less than like 20 seconds. So there's another comparison we use in the videos. They, uh, the two boys, they're playing, uh, play, they're playing uh, Atari. Basically, they have a control, uh, what is it, a TV, a control monitor, and two joysticks. That's it. If anyone that's probably about 35 and older, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you ever had Atari, I'm probably speaking another language when I say that, but believe it or not, before PS3 and in, in, in PlayStation 4, this thing called an Atari is very primitive. So, but anyway, in the video, what they do is they, they try to figure out how to play it. It's very plain and very, just the graphics are not, are not great. And then compared to today where we have the uh, Xbox and the P, uh, PS4, it's like you have the two boys playing, it's like virtual reality. And then the next segment of it is, the daughter's trying to figure out this computer called a Commodore. And basically back then, you had to actually download the programs into the computer before you could actually use the computer. You had like a little floppy disk that you had to upload the computer in order to use it. As today, as you know, if you go to Best Buy a Target, you buy a computer, you just, all you have to do is just plug it in, wait for, wait for it to down, download itself, and then you're off and ready to go. So the reason why we show that is basically how technology has evolved from the 1980s 
to today. And how, is, how social media plays a huge role in that because now back then you really couldn't interact with one another as opposed to now you can. So we try to, we try to put a little enlightenment there. This all started from somewhere basically. All right, parents. So the next one that you see up there is the social media apps that are being used by the kids today. So we do this during the presentation as well. And when we pull this slide up, all the kids are getting all excited. Your kids are like, ah, we know these apps are getting all crazy, right? And then afterwards, I ask your children, I say, listen, raise your hand. How many of your parents know how to use these apps? Your kids start dying laughing. They're like, ah, my parents don't know how to use that, and it's crazy. And then I burst their bubble. Because then I say to them, I'm like, oh, they don't know how to use it? I said, well, guess what? I said, Officer Mosley and I, we actually teach a social media parent forum, and we're going to educate your parents on how to use your social media apps, and their face changes. And they're like, really, Officer Anderson? I'm like, yeah. So they get upset about it. But longer the short, I want you to learn their apps. That's also out back. Please make sure that you take that. The most popular apps that your kids are using, uh, you can actually go on YouTube, and it will walk you through how to use their apps. You need to know what your kids are about. And I know some of you are gonna say, well, I'm old school, I don't have time for that. I'm working two jobs, just don't have time. You have to make the time, because this is just the way of the world today. Technology is it. Make sense? Fantastic. Um, it's okay. We also talk about the good about technology because there's some great things, right? I can be talking to someone right now in Japan, in China. I can share some special moments using different apps, right? Or another great one for you women that's in here and love shopping like I do, the retail options, they're endless, right? So we do talk to the children about the good things about it because we do love it, but we also get into the bad parts of social media and that's what Officer Mosley will talk about. All right, so... Excuse me. Some of the bad things about social media is the limited social interaction. Now, I've seen it. When you go to public uh, functions or, or gatherings, or something, everyone's sitting around a table and everyone's sitting there on their phone. It's like, it's, it's like no one's talking to one another unless they're through, running on their phone. No one takes the time to talk to one another. And basically what that happens is true. Is you, you, you fail to develop like, social skills. You don't have the social skills to talk to people because we're used to talking to people through on a phone. The next thing is um, lack of productivity. This is mostly for the kids. We tell the kids because what happens, and even with my kids, I'll go. I'll either if if I see I go home and I'll see the, all I see them is on the PlayStation, or they're sitting there on the phone doing something, and nothing's getting done. No work's getting done. No homework. The trash is sitting out uh, in you know out in the side of the house. There's nothing being done in the house. So. We try to tell them, you know what, limit it. you want to limit the time that you're on the, on the, on the devices. Because otherwise, what happens is the grades, do, the grades start to drop because they're up too late to uh, play on those games. So you want to really limit the amount of um, time they're on the, the devices. <laughs> I think my partner had a brain freeze. All right, catfish. Another thing that we talk to your kids about. How many of you parents know about catfish? Please raise your hand. Okay. So we have actually a fair amount, so that's awesome. Okay, so for you parents that don't know about catfish, catfish is when someone is trying to pretend like there's someone else on social media or on the internet for the sole purpose of wanting to take advantage of your children, because that's what this is about, the safety of our kids, right? Trying to take advantage of your children, either in some monetary, like monetary way, they want to take money from them, right? Or in some nasty, sexual, perverted way. That's what catfishing is. Is. So when we talk about this with the kids, I say to them, I say, so what cable channel has a reality show about catfishing? All your kids know it. They're like, MTV! So parents, if you don't know, get familiar now. Go on MTV and you can actually watch the reality show and you can see exactly what catfishing is because it's happening. So when we discuss this with your children, we don't go in depth with it because we know that they know about it, but we actually just give them some tools on how to prevent themselves from being catfished. And now Officer Mosley will get into a child predator. Right, what is a child predator? When I go in this segment, I usually talk, tell them this is, it's an individual that tries to prey on your child to try to groom them or coax them to meet them somewhere and doing inappropriate things sexually to them. And one of the things that we show is a video of a guy who goes around with parents to see how well their kids are disciplined when they use social media. And one of the clips we use is a female the guy's in the van with the parents, and he asks them, how well do you know your child? He's like, the mother's very confident. You know, we talk about you know, online predators and being, being careful because a lot of what they do is what Nicole said, is that they use this thing called catfishing to lure your kids into dangerous places. So he says, all right, so they test it out. 
He gets, he's on his, he's on his cell phone. He's telling, him, hey, meet me out. I'm your, you know, friend of your friend's brother. Come meet me out in the van. Let's go hang out. Sure enough, she comes out of that house. The mother and father are in the van with mask on. She hops in the van and they grab her. She freaks out. The parents are freaking out. The mother's, the mother's like angry as anything. And they go, you know, they go in this whole spiel of like, what have we taught you? You know, we talked about this stuff. You know, you know, she, you shouldn't be doing any of this, any of these things. It, it's, it's really, it hits, it hits home, especially with the kids. At first, they're kind of laughing, but then when they see what happens, it gets really quiet in, in the uh, auditorium or, or where we're doing this uh, presentation. And then the next one we use is a boy. He meets up with this. He wants to meet up with this girl named Amanda, and he goes over to a house. But what he doesn't know is that there's a guy waiting upstairs. Now the mother and this other guy that was doing this show are like in the other room, they're watching this, and the mother's just appalled. And she sees the guy come down the stairs and he's sitting on the couch and he's like, who are you? And he's like, I'm Amanda. And he starts screaming and the mother comes in and she starts laying into him. Like, you know, what are you doing? You shouldn't be coming over people's houses, you don't know. So, you know, it's just very, it's, it's, like I said, it's very easy for kids to get drawn into that sort of thing because they're young and they don't know any better. You know, they want to hang out with, with their friends or they want to meet this person. Uh, to, you know, to either meet up and hang out or, or buy something, okay, the stuff like that. So what we try to tell them is that your parents, again, parents got to be monitoring what your kids do, especially when they're talking to people that you don't know or they don't know. And they got to be aware of this thing called catfishing, which these child predators are using. That's right. That's me. <laughs> All right. So the next thing, so towards the end of the uh, presentation, we talk about social media responsibilities. Uh, first thing, again, you know, we tell the kids, ask your parents permission before you go on any type of social media. Then after that, don't post anything when you're angry, because once it's out there, it stays out there. Okay, when you do post things, it offends people, okay, it's very hard to try to try to rail that back in and try to backpedal, so we say, try to make up of what you said. So you've got to be careful what you say, because you don't know who you're going to offend. All right, the other thing is, I just talked about, worry about uh, online predators. Okay, and the other thing is, don't air your personal business out there. Your business is your business, <coughs> not the rest of the world's business. I don't need to know what's going on in your household, and you don't need to know what's going on in mine. All right? The other thing, anything, I think I'm done then. Um, the other, one, other thing, <laughs> one other thing is, set all privacies on, the, on your devices, to, uh, again, for your child's protection. All right, parents, as you can see, these are the social media issues that we're dealing with the most in middle school and in high school. And it's starting to trickle over a little bit into elementary school as well. So we're just going to briefly talk about those. Number one, students sending sexual images or videos of themselves to others. It's happening. And I can tell you right now, it's more so girls than it is the boys, but the boys do it too. And so what's happening is that this girl, sometimes the boys as well, they have this so-called boyfriend or girlfriend. They're in love. They then send a partial nude or sometimes a nude image of themselves to that particular boyfriend and girlfriend. Then after those two break up, what do you think happens with that photo? It's being sent to all their friends. And before you know it, that photo is all over the school. And now that daughter or that son is saying, well, I'm getting bullied now and they're feeling embarrassed because they know that they messed up from sending that image to begin with. So you need to have that conversation with your children because we're dealing with it all the time. In a moment, we're going to talk about the legal ramifications of that, but I need to make you aware. You have to have that conversation with your children. It can't happen because we're dealing with it every day in the schools. Uh, Sexton, it kind of goes hand in hand. I know some of you, your kids, they're probably saints in front of you, but you have no idea. When we sometimes look at their phones, the things that they're saying on their phones, it's crazy. So what I'm getting at is this. Take the time to look through your, how many of you guys are actually looking through your children's phones? Like every day or every other day? You have to. How many of you guys have the passcode to your, uh, your kids' phones? Good. You have to have that information and let them know it's not your cell phone, it's mine. I pay the bill, right? Exactly. So you want to make sure that you are staying up on, you know, up on things and making sure that you're checking their cell phone all the time. Online social media bullying, we've already spoke about that. It's happening, it's using the Snapchat, it's using the diff different applications. So what ends up happening is that two kids, they end up having a beef, they then create a group chat with their crew and with the uh, enemy's crew, and now they're all talking reckless on this particular app, and the next thing you know, they're setting up a fight, whether it's at a McDonald's or at the local park, and now we're involved. Have the conversation, stay away from the drama. Please have the conversation. And that's where harassment and the fights tie in. 
Officer Mosley. And last but not least, just so that you guys have an idea, so when you do talk to your children about not sending the partial nudes or the nude photos and things like that, we just want you to know, the first one, if you view, obtain, record, or send sexual images of a person, it's a felony. You need to tell your children this, because when we deal with the kids, they're like, I didn't know that that was like a crime. I didn't know that that was a felony. Oh, yes, it is. So just so you know, if your kid gets caught up with this, they can be arrested. And if they are arrested, while the case is pending, they will be separated from school. And if, for whatever reason, it ends up coming back that they have a guilty verdict, your child can end up in a juvenile lockup facility. And as far as the school side, they will be expelled from school. Please have that conversation with your children. The next one, sending sexual images or videos to a minor. That's not really for your children, but that's like that child predator that we're talking about that will try to groom your child using one of the gaming consoles, right? Or using one of the social media apps, trying to pretend like they're your kid's age when they're really not. That's what that's for. It's a felony. And we will do whatever we need to do to find them because that's one thing we don't tolerate as pedophiles. So we will find them. So we just hope that your, excuse me, your children will be comfortable enough to go to you about things like that. And the last two, Officer Mosley, thank you, is harassment and cyberbullying. They kind of go hand in hand. All it is is unwanted, constant communication with another person. It can be online, what will make it cyberbullying, or it can be texting, personal confrontation, telephone, anything unwanted and numerous times of it happening. Your children can get charged with this crime. I tell your children this when we do the presentation. You have a responsibility to come to school, get your education, and mind your business. That's it. It's pretty simple. And I say, I also understand that it's not the way of the world. Every personality isn't gonna mix with everyone's, so some people are just not gonna get along, but you need to be respectful. But your kids can get caught up, and this is what would happen. It's a misdemeanor, so it's a little bit different than a felony. They would be seeking alternate education elsewhere while this case is pending. And if they are found guilty of either one of those, they will end up having community service and having to pay a fine. And they're not gonna pay the fine because your kids don't have jobs, most of them, right? It's gonna come out of your pocket because they can't come to school and do the right thing. So please have that discussion with them. Again, there's some great information out back. I strongly suggest that you take it. This was just a quick overview just to give you some ideas as to what we're dealing with in the schools what we're teaching your kids when we're doing these social media presentations. Just know this, it takes a village, right? To raise these children. So this is what we're here for, is to spread the knowledge so that we can all work together. And I can guarantee you that we will do your part as long as you guys are willing to also work with us, right? And we'll be what we need to be, which is successful the kids here in Brockton. Make sense? Very good. Thank you guys, have a great night. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. For those of you that haven't met me, my name's Officer Nancy Lieberg. I've been with the Brockton Police Department for <laughs> 24 years. <laughs> I said that really quietly, right? Um, just to tell you a little bit about my career, uh, I was at the George School teaching fifth grade, and one of the first graders came up to me and said, my mommy wants to say hi. You were her grade officer. I'm just like, I've been doing this forever. <laughs> But great officer, as uh, Lieutenant Vidaro mentioned earlier, we're actually training five of the new guys that are coming out to be great officers. So hopefully in the near future, you will see some more interactions with the school police and school resource officers in the schools, which I think is fantastic. Now I promised myself tonight I was not gonna make this a TED Talk, but for those of you that like TED Talks, and you guys are translating this as I speak, so that's great. <laughs> TED Talk, I'm sure that translates very well. Um, the oldest study, the Harvard Grant study, um, there's been tons of TED Talks on it. What was the number one thing that they said that parents need to do when the kids are young to ensure health, happiness, and success later on in life for kids? Anybody remember or know or watch it? All right, I hope I converted you all to TED Talker watchers because it's awesome. Uh, it's this Dr. Julia Hames, and she basically breaks down the Harvard Grant study. It's been in uh, fruition for the last 80 years. They say that giving kids chores now in middle school and high school is one of the most important things to make them productive members of society, healthy and happy, and to feel that they're contributing to the family unit, with or without allowance. I think that's fascinating. 
So that's obviously what I do in my spare time. I'm telling you guys way too much about myself. Um, so this evening, the only thing between uh, you and dismissal for the night is a quick talk on drug education. Now I promised it will be brief, but there are things that you guys need to know because things have really changed. I'm not gonna go over the stats, but I do wanna point out one of the most important things. Um, the drug uh, industry, $500 billion industry, only two cents on the dollar goes toward prevention and treatment. So that should kind of give you a scope of the problem in trying to educate young people on the dangers of drugs. I come from the generation where we have the video where this is your brain on drugs and it was the egg in the frying pan and that was it. Uh, that, that PSA has obviously morphed into a much different PSA now where she totally wrecks the uh, kitchen with a frying pan. Everybody know that PSA? So um, the important thing to note from the statistics is that 90% of people that struggle with addiction, substance use disorder, begin smoking, drinking, or using other drugs before the age of 18. So keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that in a minute. Actually, we're going to talk about it right now. Um, delaying first use reduces your likelihood of becoming addicted by more than 90%. So if our message to young people can be delay first use until after your brain is fully developed, that's a win because we can reduce the likelihood of them being addicted to anything by 90%. And uh, this is like the stuff that we should be screaming from the mountaintops. Everybody should know this. This should be common knowledge, and it still isn't. So I'm gonna continue to bang the drum and let everybody know that this, this really needs to be out there because the kids think, oh, it's just vaping. Oh, it's just edibles. Oh, it's just one cigarette. And if their brain is not fully developed, which is younger than the age of 25, they can cause much later in life problems. So on the note on vaping, and I didn't want to bore you guys with showing you a bunch of vapes because I thought that would kind of bring this down. So I feel like I should have because a couple of parents said, well, I'd like to see them. I could have brought them in too, but... Basically, if you go online and all the Google images of all the available vapes are there, kids can vape what they call flavors. And when a child tells you they're just vaping flavors, it's just vape, right? So they think it's just water. But actual, in actuality, that delivery system contains aerosol. So it is as harmful as smoking cigarettes, if not more harmful. Um, the other thing is a study that was recently done that out of all the vaping flavors that said they are nicotine free, more than 90% of them of the vaping juices tested for nicotine. So I think that's kind of important for parents to know because they're being told by their, their children that it's no big deal. And then certainly we have the vaping where it can include marijuana and other drugs. Um, we did want to give a quick overview of what I call the perfect storm. So when we talk about adolescents like middle school, basically what you need to know about middle schoolers is their very instant gratification, they're risk, -taker, they're risk taking, they act first, they think later, uh, less than optimal planning, and I know you guys know because any parent here that survived the science project in what is that, eighth grade, you know about optimal, less than optimal planning because they'll spring this kind of project on you at the last minute. And that's basically adolescence. So teaching them to prepare for the future is kind of tough when their frontal lobe isn't fully developed and they can't really think about the future, which is why it's so important for them not to damage that frontal lobe by doing drugs or alcohol. So uh, on the conversation, and it's a, sometimes a philosophical debate on whether or not marijuana is addicted, this is um, a screenshot that I took from Dr. Ruth Pote's presentation. She's the Greenfield Medical Director. She's done a lot of extensive research in this area. There's no news here that you can see the most addictive nicotine, down to heroin, cocaine, then alcohol and marijuana. Um, pretty much everybody knows the level of addiction with certain drugs. She likes to point out where teens uh, start, when kids start with marijuana in their teens, they increase their level of psychological dependence by 17%, and teens that use it every day have a higher dependency as well. And again, there's no news here, but I think it's important to point out because a lot of students will say to their parents, it's no big deal, everybody smokes weed. And that's not true. 
That's absolutely not true. And again, the problem is their brains aren't fully developed till 25. So if they start putting in these illicit drugs, they're gonna, they could put themselves in a situation where they're going to have problems later on in life. The uh, school nurses who sometimes or all the time are dealing with the edible situation in the school system uh, asked me to point out tonight the difference between smoking and the difference between ingesting edibles. And I think, as the slide shows you, uh, when you ingest um, marijuana and THC, it takes 30 to 90 minutes to take effect, but then the effect can last anywhere from 4 to 12 hours. Whereas if you smoke marijuana, it peaks faster within half an hour, and it drops off within probably two hours. And the THC levels in marijuana joints in like the 70s and 80s was maybe 2 or 3 percent. And the THC now, in 2019, is upwards of 25 percent. So it's a much different drug in and of itself. The edibles, totally different. The initial loading or, or the initial dosage that they're recommended in Massachusetts for the medical marijuana is five milligrams of THC. And that's for an adult older, over the age of 25. The kids are getting a hold of uh, gummies that have THC of 15 milligrams in each gummy. And because nothing's happening within the first 30 minutes, they're ingesting two or three. So they're doing anywhere from 45 to 60 milligrams of THC. And as you can imagine, within four hours, it's, it's chaos. It's a complete crisis for the child. So um, those of you that have edibles in your house for whatever medical reason or other recreational, it's a very personal decision. Our suggestion continues to be the same as always where you should be locking that up and having it out of the control of, of younger people. Because the kids will bring it to school and they'll kind of pass it around like it's no big deal, it's just a gummy bear or gummy whatever that they're eating. In the drug presentation, uh, before I came back to working in the schools as a school resource officer, I did a stint as the opioid outreach coordinator for the police department. And one of the things that I was fascinated by is the fact that education with the opioid epidemic, um, people didn't really understand the effect of dopamine with opioids. So. We all walk around with about 100 units as our baseline of dopamine. If um, we have good food, it's going to go up to 150. If we have consensual sex, it's going to go up to 200. If you ingest cocaine, that's going to go up to about 350. Opioids is going to be in between 5 and 700 units of dopamine. And there's really nothing else on the planet like methamphetamines. That's going to be about 1350. But the problem with this is there's really nothing else in the world like opioids in the sense that it's going to chip away your baseline. So your baseline will no longer be 100 units. As a matter of fact, to put this in perspective, somebody who's struggling with depression, who's inpatient, intensive care inpatient, is gonna have about 80 units of dopamine, and it's gonna be really hard to get out of bed and take care of themselves. Somebody who abstains from opioids after they've become addicted, their baseline goes down to 30 or 40 units, where it really is impossible to get out of bed and take care of themselves. Forget about taking care of their families. So we threw that in just to kind of give you an example of what significant role dopamine plays. And then the next slide is basically natural ways to increase your dopamine. So it's something that you can talk to your kids about. Um, you know, exercising, meditating, yoga, reading a book, spending time with friends and family. Um, my favorite thing, spending time with pets. I'm at that point in my career where I love my dog more than most people. No offense to anyone here. Um, next one. So the, the big three predictors for addiction continue to be um, genetics, which you should have a candid conversation with your kids about whether or not you have family history of addiction. And early childhood trauma, anybody, and again, I was not gonna turn this into a TED Talk thing, but if you're interested, uh, there's a lot of research is done with the ACEs study. It's one of the second biggest studies where they they screened 17,000 participants, and they found that early childhood trauma has a huge, significant impact on later in life problems. Uh, but the only thing that kids can control is that early first use. So if they can delay first use to after the age of 25, they reduce their chances of being addicted to anything by 90%. And that is very significant. Um, certainly if you're talking to your own kids about it, instead of saying delay first use, 
you could obviously say avoid first use. If you never try it, you'll never know if you're going to struggle in the first place. So have a talk with your family regarding your family history and delaying first use. And if you want some resources that you don't want to take in the printed fashion that are on that back table Nicole talked about, you can go to drugfree.org backslash resources and there's a ton of downloadable stuff for families. Um, if you have more questions, one way to reach out to us, if you enjoyed what you saw tonight, you can send us an email. My email is nancy at broxonpolice.com. If it's a negative one, I'll just delete it. If it's good, I'll forward it to my lieutenant. And he'll think, well, this is the greatest thing we've done in a long time, which I think is great. But I do want to thank you guys for coming out tonight, and I'm going to turn it back over to my lieutenant. Okay, I hope that you've all enjoyed this and you've taken a lot of information in tonight. I understand that. Um, and like Nancy did say, if you have any questions, you can always email her. You can email myself. Um, I'm at fvadaro, common spelling, at brocktonpolice.com or frankvadaro at bpsma.org. Once again, thank you all for coming in tonight. I'm going to hand this over to Deputy Superintendent Mike Thomas. He'll say a few words. Thank you, Lieutenant Vidaro. Let's thank them again for their presentation. Thank you. Also, um, Tom Minicello, the Vice Chair of the School Committee from Ward 1. Um, he came in during the presentation. He's here as well. And I also want to say one more thing about the School Committee. As you know, um, the school department over the last five years, um, we've unfortunately cut over 200 positions due to budget cuts. But one thing the school committee and the mayor's office has always done is made sure the budget for safety and security stays solid. Um, they've always done that. And it's very important to know that um, the people that um, come up with the budget make sure that they put enough money in to make sure we're able to do the new entrances you see at most of the schools we have a few left to do the surveillance cameras the the fobs to, um, for staff to get into the building the IDs um, the door locks that are the um, the most up-to-date door locks that they make for schools um, those kind of enhancements to schools and buildings it, it costs a lot of money we do a lot of things in-house because we do have in-house in craftsmen uh, that do the work, but it still takes a lot of money to employ them, buy the materials, and also what we've done with school police with the new hires. So I want to thank the school committee and the mayor's office for always putting safety and security uh, near the top of the list in, in very tough um, you know, times with, with the budgets. They've always kept safety and security at the forefront, so we thank them for that. Again, thank you for coming tonight. We'll be around uh, for a few minutes after, so feel free to ask us any questions. Uh, and thanks again. Thank you.